thank you very much uh, everyone for uh, joining uh, this colloquium. Today we have a, a special uh, speaker, uh, Professor uh, Ivo Białyniski Birula, who uh, probably I don't need to introduce to you. Uh, of course, he is the uh, founding father of Center for Theoretical Physics. Um, he is a recipient of the um, uh, Polish Nobel Foundation for uh, Polish Science Prize, uh, um, member of the Polish Academy of Science, and, uh, and a very, very well-known uh, physicist. So uh, today, uh, Professor Jawiński will uh, talk about the photon, a very particular elementary particle. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, I am sorry to be here in a way, because that just means that Łukasz Tulski was unable to come and deliver this seminar. I cannot promise you the fireworks that usually accompany the talk by Łukasz Tulski. This will be just a plain talk in theoretical physics, but I hope that I will transfer some knowledge that I believe I possess to you. And this is knowledge that is usually not very popular. Well, many years ago, Albert Einstein wrote, all the 50 years of conscious brooding have brought me no closer to answer the question, what are light quanta? Of course, today every rascal thinks he knows the answer, but he's deluding himself. Rascal is a rather obsolete term uh, in English, but also translation into Polish is hultai. So this is not something that is used, although sometimes one would like to make a use of this term. Well, this quotation from Einstein became very popular and there are many wallpapers with this quotation, wallpapers from different things. And now I came to photon as a particle. Well, as you can see from this table, photon is a very peculiar particle. It is distinguished because it has a lot of connections with other particles. Of course, it is connected to all charges. Every particle that has a charge interacts with photon. The only competition that photon has is the Higgs boson, who is coupled to the mass. So every particle that has a mass is coupled to the Higgs particle. This is a nice picture because it also shows that Higgs is coupled to itself because it's a nonlinear Lagrangian the scalar particle. The same is true about the, about the Z boson, which is also coupled to itself. So, in, and of course, the graviton is coupled to itself, if it exists at all, as an elementary particle. Here, the jury is not yet out to announce whether graviton is a quantum particle, elementary particle, or not. So, here is photon, among other particles, and it is a uh, way surprising that Einstein utter this word because he said that in the 50s but he should have known if he was interested in this kind of research he was certainly not interested that Wigner wrote a very important paper where he gave full classification of all possible elementary particles which are described by the relativistic theory. So this is a very nice paper of Wigner, I recommend, and it's written even though it was published as a mathematical paper, it's full of physical insight. So in this paper, I'm sorry, I will now hold the microphone so that you can hear me. Well, in this paper, 
here is the first page of this paper, if I can. So it doesn't switch now. Yes, this is the first page, and as you see, it was published in Annals of Mathematics. So it is a paper that is phrased with the use of mathematical terms. But of course, he begins with essential features of quantum mechanics. And in this paper, he just proves that there are two kinds of photons, left-handed and right-handed. And this is the important fact which makes photons different from particles with spin, like electrons. Photons do not have spin in its usual sense. They only have helicity. And helicity is not the same as spin, as I will explain in a moment. There are left-handed photons and right-handed photons, and they're separate. What does it mean that they are separate? That means that we have two separate wave functions to describe these two photons. And this is what Wigner described in great detail. And each of those functions is a representation of the full Poincaré group. So you see that this is a strange situation when you have a one-dimensional object which is a representation of a rather complicated group, 10-parameter group, but it is indeed so. I will use the wave vector instead of momentum because for photons that is more appropriate. So according to Wigner, we have the Hilbert space of photon states, photon wave functions, and as all Hilbert spaces must have, it has the scalar product here. Scalar product is, oops. The scalar product is relativistically invariant, of course, as it should be. And uh, the scalar product, of course, leads to the norm. And when we have the norm, we can use the probabilistic interpretation of the photon wave function. And as every student would have guessed, the meaning, physical meaning of the photon wave function is that modulus squared with this factor of k to make it relativistic is the probability density to find the photon with momentum hk. Of course, we would like to have also wave functions in ordinary position space, but that is a tricky point, and I will come to this later. So here we have the very brief description of Wigner's theory of photons. And as I said, they are not spinning particles for the following reasons. One can always find in books that photons have spin h bar or minus h bar, depending on LSE. However, <clears throat> this is not like <clears throat> ordinary spin for the following reason. The states of electrons and photons can be characterized in terms of helicity. Fo electrons also can be described in terms of helicity. And even some experimental physicists studying electrons like this description in terms of helicity. However, a right-handed photon observed by any observer is always right-handed, while the electron is right-handed only in one reference frame. If you have an electron which is right-handed as far as helicity is concerned, then you move to a different frame and you find that there is another mixture of the opposite helicity. The state in other frames is a superposition. Now, we can apply this language 
also to photons because it's quite useful when it comes to later developments. So we do have two kinds of photons and we can combine them into one wave function with two independent components. What does it mean independent? That means that each component, upper component and lower component, transforms separately under all transformations, rotations, and Lorentz transformations. One can work out the rules for these transformations. They're quoted in some of our papers. One can find function theta of k, which gives the phase factor. Of course, there could only be a phase factor because we keep normalization intact. So the state of polarization changes as you see when you use this two component wave function because upper component transforms differently than the lower component and when you want to describe this in terms of linear polarization you find that linear polarization is not an invariant characteristic of the photon state so what experimental is often referred to as horizontal and vertical polarization is not a very wise description. So here we also find a very important difference between photons and other particles. There exists the photon number, but there is no photon density. And this created hundreds, if not thousands of papers most of them are completely senseless. In these papers, people try to find the photon density in space, in ordinary space, not in position space. <laughs> Such an object does not exist. And I will explain this in some detail. But there is the photon number, the total photon number. And this total photon number here will be derived from classical electromagnetism. We know for any electromagnetic field, which is sufficiently regular and does not spread indefinitely in space, what is the energy of the electromagnetic field? I have written this energy in a peculiar way with the three-dimensional delta function here. Uh, just to make easier the calculations here. So the energy of the electromagnetic field is well defined. There is no quantum ingredient in this formula for the energy. It's just the square of electric vector and the square of magnetic vector with appropriate coefficients to make things proper and dimensional. And that, now we can use a simple trick. We can divide this total energy by the photon energy. How do we do it? It's the delta function which I introduced that helps to do it. Namely, if I have a delta function here, and I can divide by h omega because I can use the Fourier representation of the delta function, which is well known and if i write this fourier representation of the delta function then i can divide by the photon energy the famous planck formula except that planck didn't use h bar but only the straightforward h now this integral is a simple exercise for students can be evaluated and it gives r minus r prime squared in the denominator. And now I go back to my formula for the total number, and I introduce here this result, and this is how I got this formula from the formula for the energy. This formula was derived, the formula for the total photon number, was derived for the first time by Zeldovich 
Jakob Borisovich, who derived this formula in a different way. He considered radiation field. In the, in the radiation field, we know what is the energy. These are solutions of Maxwell equations. We can talk about plane waves and the simple solutions. Then for each plane wave in this radiation field, we know what is the energy is H omega. K at the omega, H bar omega. And then he summed up the formula for all plane waves, the radiation field. And this is how he got this formula, which we now call the Zoldovich formula. By the way, the paper that we wrote some few years ago was rejected, I think, four times, saying that this does not make sense because electromagnetic field, like the electric field, does not have photons. Therefore, we cannot talk about the photon number. At the end, we managed to publish this in a tricky way because our friend Persico died and there was a special issue of the journal. And of course, if you write a paper for the special issue, memorizing one of the deceased physicists, no one can reject your contribution. Okay, so this is the photo, the problem of the photon number, and this is a Dovich formula, and we now can proceed further. Now, we can now use this formula just for fun of it to see how many photons are in various electromagnetic fields. And this is what many people objected. I must say that my wife always objected, saying that constant field cannot have photons. And then I invented an argument which I think is convincing. Suppose that this electric field is not constant, but it decays. It's a radiation field with the lifetime of the lifetime of the universe then it is radiation field in the sense of Zeldovich and then we can use so if we can use it on the cosmic scale then we can use it also here so now we can do the calculations and I compare to result the number of photons in the magnetic field is 10 to the fifth larger in than in comparable electric field so magnetic field has many more photons than the electric of course one may argue that one gauss is not one volt per centimeter but in human scale that's about a good comparison and here now we can go further and we can take a box a box with edge l and we calculate according to zeldovich formula the number of electric photons, uh, electric field is in volt per meter, and magnetic photons. And again, you see, you see two things. First, the number of magnetic photons is huge as compared to the number of electric photons here. But also what is more important is this factor L to the fourth. If the number of photons growth as the fourth power of the side of this cube, that it means that there is no photon density because density would require L to the power of three. So this is another proof that one cannot talk about the local big one. But of course the energy density is okay. Of course. But photons are particles we would like to have how it is and this is connected with this never-ending story of photon position in order to have the photon density most people try to introduce the position operator for the photon when you have the position operator then you may claim that you have the position representation of the wave function 
and then you take the modulus squared of this position representation and you claim that this is the photon density. It does not work for the following reason. Now, this is the paper that we finally published in this peculiar Chinese journal. So, we can, before we go back to this photon position, let me just tell you about other differences between photons and ordinary massive particles. And this is concerned with my beloved subject of uncertainty relations. Well, do photons obey the uncertainty relations? If you think for a while, you think there must be something that prevents you from making photons which have well-defined momentum and somehow are well localized but how to write a mathematical formula that expresses this property the standard method fourier transform does not work we have the fourier representation can be written we have f of k you can write the fourier integral what's wrong with this fourier integral mathematically it's a well-defined function of x y and z why it doesn't make sense because this function f of x, y, and z is not local. What does it mean? If I go to a rotated frame, we know what should happen to the wave function in position representation. Since this is a one-dimensional object, the only difference between the previous and rotated wave function could be that you replace the positions x, y, and z by rotating values. Doesn't work because it turns out that after the Fourier transformation, this object is non-local. It does not de describe only something that happens at x, y, z, but it has a non-local property. We can correct this, but in a way which is not so trivial. So, there is no local object, and this is how it is. Well, so the photon position wave function is a local object. If we do not do the Fourier transformation on the function f of k, but attach, if we attach to this oops, uh, wave function, uh, the polarization vector. The polarization vector for the circularly polarized waves is well-defined object. It is a function of, uh, of uh, components of the wave vector. And when you do this trick, when you multiply first and then you do the Fourier transformation, you get a genuine local field. Not only this field is a genuine, but it is very closely related to well-known Maxwell functions. Namely, if I take this complex function, psi, which I defined here, and then I divide this complex function into its real part and imaginary part, then a miracle happens these two functions defined in terms of this wave function obey the maxwell equations so we have a direct connection between the photon wave function and the maxwell theory not only that but also now we see that what was not possible for photons can be done for the electromagnetic field. We know very well that we can make superposition of electromagnetic fields with different polarization. If you take a superposition of the electromagnetic field with right-handed and the left-handed polarization, if the coefficients are equal, then you get the linear polarization. If you have some phases, then you have optical elliptical polarization so 
there is this connection and this wave function. I believe that I was the first who really named this the photon wave function. If you write photon wave function in Google, you see a reference to my paper. And there was a lot of quarrel about this problem because why people argued that this is not a good wave function because oops, because these are not good wave function in the sense that if you multiply this by x y or z it is no longer a good wave function because it is not divergence less and this slide shows how is it so that the polarization vector, which I have written here, fixes the problem with locality. Recall that F plus minus picks up a phase when you go to a different coordinate system. And when you do the analysis carefully, you find that if you substitute for K, the new K, then the polarization vector picks up the opposite phase factor, which cancels the phase factor. So the product of these two does not have this phase factor at all. It transforms as a local electromagnetic field as seen here. So now we will return to uncertain relations, but this is what I already said. If you multiply this photon wave function by X, Y, or Z, this is no longer a correct wave function. Operators in quantum mechanics are such objects that transform one state into another state. And if this state does not exist, it is not a good quantum mechanical operator. Now we try to attack the problem of uncertainty relations. Well, the energy density is modulus squared of the photon wave function, which shows that this wave function is a good representation in the sense that it tells you what is the probability to find the energy of the photon, not the probability to find the photon as such. So in other words, we accept the statement that photon is located where its energy is. By the way, photon does not have much, does not have mass, does not have charge. So the energy is the main characteristic, and this is what should be studied when we want to find where this particular photon is most likely to be found. And here is then, if you accept the view that energy density is a good substitute for the probability density to find the photon, you can define the spread of the photon in space. And this is the usual definition, R squared, integrated and divided by the, the total energy. Now, what do we do with the momentum? Well, we do the same. We know the momentum wave function. We can integrate this wave function with momentum, divide by total momentum, and we have the spread in momentum space. And now it's a mathematical analysis. What can we say about the product of one delta r squared and another delta p squared. This is what is the essence of the uncertainty relation. And you can do this calculation. It is a non-trivial calculation, but can be done, say, in a, in a day by a person who is not very much in, into this subject. And we find that the variational procedure gives us the lower bound 
for this product. The bound gamma cannot exceed, it cannot be lower than three halves of H. I'm sorry, it's one plus square root of five divided by two, which is higher than three halves. We would expect for massive particles, we have three halves because we have three degrees of freedom, one half H bar for each degree of freedom. So we have three halves and one plus square root of five divided by two, a magic number. It is somewhat related to golden ratio, but I think don't think it's important. And there is even a photon wave function that saturates this inequality. Usually for non-relativistic wave function, it is a Gaussian. Gaussian wave functions saturate standard uncertain relations. Here, it is not a pure Gaussian because in addition to the Gaussian part here, it also have this prefactor. And this is something which was to be expected. There's no scale in this subject. Photon does not have a mass, therefore there is no scale. And if there is no scale, there cannot be a solution which depends on the scale. So the scale is here arbitrary. Any factor A gives the wave function which saturates the uncertain relations. So the summary is that photons, when they are treated as elementary particles, can be understood much better, or at least there is some additional knowledge that we acquire if we just proceed as we should according to what Wigner said. The photon wave function is a irreducible <laughs> representation of the Poincare group. And starting from this point, we can proceed you see, and see that everything can be developed with one important difference. There is no position operator. And there are people, there is one, Mrs. Houghton in Canada, who for I don't know, 20 years was producing papers. There is also a distinguished group in Poland, in Łódź, where they work on the position operator for photons. And they succeeded even publishing their paper, which makes no sense because their position operator is arbitrary. They must introduce a coordinate system, a fixed coordinate system if you change the coordinate system, then their definition produces a different position operator. Thank you very much. And at consortes, I would say. There's several others who pursue this topic and they are impregnated, no argument that this is completely arbitrary because you can choose any. De their definition contains an explicit introduction of the coordinate system. So Merry Christmas. Uh, thank you very much for, for a very uh, in-depth talk on this topic. So now we have time for questions. Uh, I have a probably stupid question, but is it possible to extend this concept of number of photons uh, to other gauge particles, for example, <laughs> uh, gluons? Is it possible to calculate I, the number of gluons se in, inside se a several, proton? Several years ago, I offered even the price for that. The problem is the nonlinearity of the gauge transformation. So the energy cannot be written without potentials. That's the problem. The energy of the gluons is a well-defined concept. It's an integral of the local density of this young mu sphere. Mm -hmm. And you can write this formula 
And the next step is this trick that I used. Because there are potentials in addition to fields, and I don't know, that would be a very good problem. I even tried to do it perturbatively, but it's ugly. Mm -hmm. So anyone who can derive this formula, I can offer a prize. <laughs> So maybe I'm mistaken, but uh, when I looked at uh, Wigner's paper, it was submitted in uh, 37 and then published in 39. Why it took so long? Any problems? <laughs> in those days, the journals were, were in a different way. There is a famous story involving Einstein, who was completely taken back when he learned that his paper was sent to a referee. He said, this is my paper. How do you dare to send my paper to a, to a referee? And then he even withdrew his paper because he felt offended. And the same was true in mathematical journals. They had, of course, this paper was not a mathematical paper. And that probably held it for so long because they couldn't find in the, among the editors of Anders of mathematics, somebody who would understand quantum mechanics. Because otherwise, many journals were faster in the sense of generalizing. Ah, yes, yeah, yeah. But in this case, perhaps it was so elegant paper that only a few people were capable of understanding its content. And from from the present point of view, it was a very simple. Maybe yes, but it's extremely elegant paper, and of course, uh, I would say the, the term application of group theory yeah. to, to, to quantum mechanics on a, uh, I mean, he closed the subject, basically. At the end, I perhaps should say a few words about Einstein. I understand why he uttered these words about rascals who think that they understand photons because probably he meant something different. Even now we don't understand quantum mechanics. Therefore, somehow he thought that understanding photon would mean understanding quantum mechanics. The presentation that you saw here, it does not add anything to our understanding of quantum mechanics. It just shows that within this magnificent structure which is called quantum mechanics photon sits very well and it has some special properties but otherwise it does not have any unusual properties from this point of view but if you say that god does not play dice and you think that therefore to understand photon you must understand god then of course it's a hopeless case If experimentalists is allowed to ask a question, <coughs> I have the following. <coughs> People are now routinely generating and creating single photons or pairs of entangled photons which are sent away in opposite directions and detected and correlated, etc., etc. And all sorts of sophisticated things is being done with those photons. And the descriptions of those phenomena is well understood, it is believed. Is there anything new one would expect unobvious to observe to, to, to distinct um, descriptions uh, from such experiments? I am certain that there is something that is not taken into account. Namely, all these experiments are very refined experiments, but they are the interpretation uh, is not full, I would say. The interpretation is in terms of well-established rules of uh, photon production by in nonlinear crystals and all that. However, it does not touch on, on the quantum mechanical meaning. For example, as far as entanglement goes, then this analysis that I presented here gives a somewhat different perspective as to what is the entanglement. 
of photon states. The entanglement of photons is treated rather casually. It's, I don't think it is treated with full understanding of what's going on. One talks about the entanglement between polarization degrees of freedom and the other degrees of freedom. However, here, again, people who do it consider photons as being uh, quantum particles with the same properties that is they are localized somewhere and this is not true non-localization of photons is not treated with special care in these experiments uh, if i if i may if i may continue yes of course photon is uh, a click uh, there is, but there is one thing which is important. People who wanted to make sure just to check various, uh, various uh, possible loops in these protocols, that the photons on both ends arrives uh, after uh, arrives uh, after the, the the generation of polarization was made to avoid some bias of those experiments. So in that respect. The correlations concerning polarizations are, are pretty, pretty, pretty well close to what you would expect from quantum mechanics. So I don't think so that they have much of the loops because that's what they were looking for. Well, uh, I think this is what Kazik mentioned: the clicks, the clicks, and the clicks are treated as something which we do not go more deeply into a click is just a click however from the sophisticated point of view it's a very complicated process which has to do something with homodyne because if you want to absorb the photon which generates this click you must first have the oscillator there that will respond to the photon impinging on this detector and this is just completely ignored i mean it does, one does not go any deeper one says uh, click means that the photon was detected and that's it however this whole process is never analyzed in any more detail and i think here is some important difference uh, also I could talk about these things for hours. However, if one compares the photon clicks with electron clicks, then one sees the essential difference, even though the clicks are treated the same way that is if the scintillator showed signal, that means that electron was detected. However, for the electrons, the phase has a completely different meaning because the phase of the electron wave function contains in addition to non-relativistic phase which is measured in any uh, experiment starting with the photon diffraction also contains mc squared phase the, the relative the phase connected with relativistic oscillations of the electron wave function. And the homodyning in this case must involve something in the measuring apparatus which cancel this phase. Otherwise, we would not have any observation. The phase will just oscillate so quickly that you will not get a definite. So there is some mis here, I don't know what, but I think that there is some important not understood element in this whole process of clicking. Do we have any more questions? Maybe on. In the presentation, you show the, the minimum uncertainty of a photon is uh, greater than uh, 3 over 2 h bar that's the you said it is uh, due to the massless uh, property of the photon 
or why it, it should be above uh, the minimum uncertainty? Well, the problem of uncertain relations has a wider significance. We also calculated the electron uncertainty principle according to relativistic theory. And it is different in the relativistic theory than in the non-relativistic. In the non-relativistic theory, everything that is simple is a Gaussian. However, even for electrons, the right-hand side of the uncertain relation is different than the non-relativistic. So it is not surprising that for photons, this right-hand side, photons are, so to speak, more, sp more, more spread. You cannot concentrate photons in phase space as you would like to do, and you can do it for non-relativistic particles. Uncertain relations should always be considered separately for relativistic particles and for non-relativistic particles. In, in all cases, relativity makes the particles less concentrated in phase space. Are there any questions on Zoom? Okay, so if there's no more questions, let us thank the speaker again. Thank you.